Do Jews believe in karma? We're going to touch on some Eastern religion uh, as well because karma is something that is primarily discussed in the East. So we're going to talk about that and the dynamic with, with Judaism. And it's interesting because Roger Kamenetz, who's author of The Jew and the Lotus, what he said was that th one-third of all Western Buddhists all the Western Buddhist leaders, a third of them have Jewish roots. One third. Half of the participants, half of the participants in the meditation retreat in Dharamshala, India, are Israelis. Half. And in the 1960s and 1970s, some in this room may remember, that there were people, it was so widely spread amongst the Jewish community, people learning about Eastern religion, that they called them, they actually had nicknames, they called them Jubus or Hindus, right? So this is something that we need to talk about in the scope of what is a Jew believe, what is, what is, what is connected with our faith, and, and maybe where some of those ideas in the East even came from. You know, it's interesting, we had a, uh, you know how Chabad houses are always trying to come up with like catchy little uh, events. So they have like pizza in the hut during Sukkot or sushi in the sukkah. So we had one a few years ago named Karma and Shwarma. So, you know, this is, this is, there'll be a continuation of that. So the Dalai Lama actually encouraged rabbis to make Jewish mystical teachings available and accessible to the masses. He says it's no, there's no reason for the Jewish people who have such a robust spiritual tra tradition to be running to the East, to, to need to, to feel spiritual, to have to go to a different faith. And so many people are not learning about the spirituality and the mysticism, because they have a misimpression that Judaism doesn't believe in spirituality or have any sort of mysticism. In fact, I met a, a young woman several years ago, and I've had a great conversation with her. She identified herself as a Jubu, someone who was studying Buddhism, born Jewish, everything like that. And I was in the conversation, I was talking to her, what made you want to explore religion in the East? Like, what was the... And she said that her upbringing was, she went to Hebrew school, and then after Hebrew school, that was, as is the tradition, that's the end of your Jewish studies. And she referred to Judaism, the Judaism that she knew and understood, she called it Disney Judaism. That she had an 11-year-old or a 12-year-old's understanding of what Judaism was all about. And so we discussed, how can anybody have an appreciation of anything that they only have an 11-year-old's understanding of. So the first thing that's so important for the Jewish community at large to know is that we have a robust spiritual and mystical tradition, number one. Secondly, what we have to understand is the nature of what we as Jews believe the Torah is. So the Torah is more than just a book, and more than just five books as well. It's described in the Medrash and the Zohar as the blueprint of creation, meaning that God looked into this blueprint. It was like the architecture of the universe. God looked into this Torah, this computer code, if you will, and out popped the universe. The universe is simply an expression of the computer code that is inscribed in the Torah text, okay? And so there, anything that is true in reality, anything that has any bearing of truth in this universe has a source in the Torah. Everything, because again, the Torah is the computer code. The Torah is the blueprint of the universe. And so it's, it's sort of like the, the genetic material that the universe is made out of, it's made out of the Torah. God 
creating the universe is expressed in the Torah. So the Torah refers to an entire body of godly knowledge. It's not just the first five books. It's something that is the entire collective literature of the Talmud, the Medrash, all the Kabbalistic works. That all is considered Torah. Okay. Now, although the Torah was given publicly and mandated 3,300 years ago, 3,300 uh, and 35 years ago to be exact, the the traditions, the idea uh, of Torah, the wisdom of Torah, the secrets of Torah was something that was available and embedded in humanity even before the Torah was given. Our tradition teaches that Adam learned Torah in the Garden of Eden, right? It's been here since the beginning. That Noah, if you look at the Torah portion that talks about Noah and the flood, it says that he separated the animals, that he was commanded by God to separate the animals, two of each non kosher animal, and seven of each kosher animal, meaning that even before the Torah was given, it was already known. The Torah's values and secrets and wisdom was already embedded in creation. That mystical wisdom, the secrets, the wi- it was all there from the beginning. Shame and Aver, Noah's son and grandson, they had an ongoing yeshiva after the flood, a place where people studied Jewish law and Jewish mysticism. Torah is with us from the beginning. In fact, the Talmud says that our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all kept the entire Torah before it was given, before it was mandated. So Torah tradition goes back very far. In fact, any source of wisdom, any source of spirituality or truth is contained as, and as a direct, has a direct source from the Torah. In fact, our tradition teaches us that, historically speaking, the wisdom, history's most influential wisdom keepers, all are traced to getting their wisdom from the Torah. So, for example, Pythagoras, our tradition teaches, he, had, he got his wisdom, his belief in reincarnation came from the Torah came from Kabbalah, came from Jewish mysticism, the Jewish prophets. Socrates, our tradition teach, teaches, studied from uh, Achitophel and Asaf Hakarchi. Socrates, even amongst the writings of the early Greeks, of the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, after, it, it teaches that after the prophet Jeremiah was in Egypt, uh, excuse me, after the prophet Jeremiah was exiled to Egypt, he taught Plato, the famous Greek philosopher, he taught him the teachings of Torah. And that's why many of Plato's teachings are in sync with Torah. What our tradition teaches is that when, when Jer- Jeremiah, uh, after the temple was destroyed, Jeremiah came to Jerusalem and Plato was there and they met each other and they had a discussion. And Plato asked Jeremiah, why is it that you're crying over a bunch of rubble. Why are you crying over a bunch of bricks, abandoned bricks, destroyed bricks? And so Jeremiah asked Plato, do you have any philosophical questions about life and reality that you have unanswered still? And Plato had a whole bunch, and Jeremiah answered each and every one of them. And Jeremiah says, the reason that I'm mourning this destruction, the reason that I'm mourning and I'm crying over the bricks and mortar of this, of this, because this is the source of where all that wisdom came from. This temple, this Torah. Aristotle says also in our tradition that that he received his teaching from Jewish sources. So all of Western philosophy rooted in Torah tradition. Now let's talk about some of the religions of the East, because if we're getting into karma, we're going to talk about it, uh, we need to understand a little bit about the wisdom of the East. So in, in Hinduism, it's a very old religion. It's formed of a, a bunch of diverse traditions and is generally associated with the multiplicity of gods, that there's a lot of gods. Uh, and it, does, it doesn't advocate the worship of any one particular deity. All of the gods and goddesses of Hinduism are actually said to be manifestations or representation of one uh, sort of aspect of one supreme being. Okay, that's, that's the idea of Hinduism. Buddhism came a little bit later. In, in the year 623 BCE, before the Common Era, uh, Siddhartha Gautama uh, was a, he was a, he was a, a Hindu prince, 
And he it was later referred to as the Buddha. Buddha means the enlightened one. And he, uh, he began his meditation as a Hindu. And he was awakened, and this enlightenment, he began to denounce Hinduism, and he emerged as the founder of a new religion. Buddhism does not believe in a god. Uh, it is seen as a refined version of Hinduism. That was sort of the idea. Now, there are many sects within Eastern religion. We obviously don't have the time to go through all of them, but I wanted to sort of get a general understanding to sort of give a backdrop to the picture that we're trying to paint over here. Interesting that that Torah is the, the root of all spirituality, even Eastern spirituality. In our tradition, Abraham, after his wife Sarah passes away, he gets married to Keturah. Keturah he fathers, he, he fathers with Keturah six children and sends them to the east. It says in the book of Genesis, book of Bereshis, uh, that he, he blessed his son Isaac. That's who he loved and everything. And then it says he gave the other children gifts and sent them to the east. The, the children he had with Keturah, he gave, them, he, gave, he gave them gifts and sent them to the east. And our tradition teaches something very interesting. The gifts that he gave his children with Keturah they were not physical gifts because those were given to Isaac. They were spiritual gifts. Spiritual wisdom, mystical teachings that they could use, divine names, rudimentary wisdom, esoteric knowledge from which the entire world, from which an entire world of spirituality and wisdom could be built. It's interesting that Chinese history begins between 4,000 and 5,000 years ago, and their wisdom, the spiritual wisdom that they have over there, where do they attribute it to? From spiritual giants who came from afar. Now, interestingly enough, the, you know, the, the, the teachings that have now been going on in, through Hinduism and Buddhism, it's not like we can go study in Hinduism and Buddhism and, and that's necessarily in line with Judaism. The premises are there, but over the years it has become connected with, you know, idolatrous practices and things that we need to sort of avoid. But the premises, the ideas of the spirituality, the mysticism, the esoteric knowledge was given by Abraham to his children with Keturah, and that went to the east. Interestingly enough, just, just some fun facts. Who's ready for some fun facts? I can't see you, so I can only hear you. Yes, all right, there we go. How about some fun facts? Okay, so let's talk about some similarities over here. So the word Hindu in Sanskrit, which is their holy language, the word Hindu means from the river, over the river. Right? And what was Abraham called? Abraham and his children were called Ivri, right? Hebrews. Right? What does Ivri mean? Over the river. Why? Because Abraham and his generation was standing on one side of the river, and the rest of the world, which believed in other things, all sorts of other gods, they were on the other side of the river. So he was called Ivri because it means over the river. Hindu means over the river, from the river. Interesting little tidbit. One of the main wisdoms of the religion of the East, of, of their religion, is the Vedas. Now, interestingly enough, one of the children that were, that were sent uh, through Keturah was named Avidas, right? Another interesting thing is a camp in Hinduism. If you want to say the word camp, right, it's called an ashram. Right? And so, according to Rashi, one of the son's names was a word that means camp. What was his name? Ashurim. Right? So you see the similarities that are over there, or the, or the remnants of the Hebrew wisdom that was once a part of this thing. Interestingly enough, this, this, is, this blew me away. So, you want to get blown away too? This blew me away. This is so cool. Okay. So, one of the things that Abraham taught his, the spiritual gifts that he gave him was certain divine names that could be used for, for certain uh, practices, certain spirituality. So there is a, a Kabbalistic name of God called the 72-letter name of God. And it's based on three verses in the book of Exodus, chapter 14. Okay, And these are three verses that are right before the splitting of the sea. 
And so all three verses have something very interesting and similar about them. Each verse has 72 letters, and each verse is talking about the power of Almighty God. And so what our Kabbalistic tradition teaches is that these three verses are used to construct what we call the 72-letter name of God. And again, it's not really 72 letters, it's actually 72 combinations of letters. Because what it is, is that you take the first letter from the first verse, you take the last letter from the second verse, and you take the first letter from the first verse, right? and they make uh, uh, triplets, right? Th one, letter, uh, one letter from the first, one letter from the second, one letter from the third, and they make these triplets of names. So it's seven, not 72 letters, it's 72 really triplets of letters. And that forms these different names, these different divine code names. You know what one of, that, one of the three letter combinations are? Right? Aleph, Vav, Mem. What does Aleph, Vav, Mem spell in Hebrew? Om. Isn't that cool? Super duper cool. Okay. So you, you, you find some of, the, some of the remnants, some of the remnants of the Eastern religion, you find you can, you can still have a, have, a, have a glimpse of the Hebrew knowledge in which it came. In fact, there is a whole caste of people in India that won't marry those in like sort of like the lower status, and they're called the Brahmins. And so Brahmins has a very similar, uh, in, in fact, the A, A was dropped in a lot, of, a lot of names. So Abraham, Abraham, right? Brahmins, Abraham, right? So from, uh, from, from Abraham. I interestingly enough, in 2002, in the, Chinese, in, in the Journal of Chinese Medicine, there was actually a, an article published which showed that all of the touch points for tefillin, right, for that tefillin of the arm and tefillin of the head, that the, that the different points in which the tefillin touch on the head were actually ancient Chinese acupuncture points for spiritual wisdom and enlightenment. So again, not that we can go to the East and study it and that we're, that, that's, called, that, that, that's learning Judaism, but we see that, that the wisdom in which they have, a lot of it, is very much rooted in ancient Hebrew wisdom, ancient Hebrew mystical wisdom. So let's talk about some of the, well, we're going to go into a little bit more detail about Eastern religion, and that's going to help us understand our belief in karma. So far, so good? Yeah? yeah? I know it's late, but let's, let's rock and roll. All right. So as far as the way to look at Eastern religions, so Ruff Cook, who was, was a a great Torah scholar in the 20th century, he takes a look at world religions, and he mentions Buddhism twice, as far as I know, in his discussion of Eastern religions. And he said, his philosophy is, and it's a kind of an interesting philosophy, he says that there, there's certainly, there, there's, there's wisdom across the world, right? There's spiritual insight across the world, but there's nowhere in the world that has it as pristine as Judaism, and he, com he contrasts it with the life force, right, that a blade of grass has a, a plant's life force, it is a live thing, and then there's a redwood tree, right? They're both plants, and they both have the life force of a plant, but you can't compare a blade of grass life force with a redwood tree life force. That's, that's how he explained it. He says you can find wisdom, and you can find growth, and you can find uh, mysticism, other but the root of it, the source of it, the life force is greatest in Judaism. Now, let's start with some of the similarities uh, with, with, let's say, Buddhism and, and, uh, and Jewish mysticism, okay? So, Buddhism speaks of certain negative traits that we have to nullify, right? The negative traits, figuratively, they are linked to the four elements. They are tools for liberating oneself from suffering, meaning, um, they are, they are not the substances of elements, they're not like a physical thing, but they are sort of sensory qualities that are used to eradicate bad traits. It's interesting, because what are the, what are the, four, what are the four traits, what are the four elements? The same thing as it is in, in Jewish mysticism. The Kabbalists refer to the four elements, right? Earth, water, fire, and air. 
And each of those trait, each of those elements represents a negative trait within the human being that we have to sort of overcome, right? Fire, what's a, what's a fiery personality person? What is, what is someone who struggles with the, the element of fire? That's someone who gets angry or hot-headed, right? We have, even have the term hot-headed, right? Or they're all fired up, right? That's someone who struggles with anger and struggles with things that of a fiery nature, Water, water, because water uh, grows all sorts of pleasure, pleasurable objects, uh, pleasurable uh, uh, plants and, and, and things, it, it brings life to the world. This is someone who is, who, who their uh, struggle is with, with uh, their pleasure seekers, right? They always want to get some sort of uh, pleasure. Uh, someone who uh, struggles with air, and, uh, the, the quality of air within us and the four elements, what is air? Someone who is an airy person, what does that represent? Someone who's like uh, arrogant or, 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 a, or a gossiper, you know, someone who's right, very airy personality. We kind of know what, what uh, we, 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 we use, we, the terms are so common to us that we even use it in our regular uh, colloquial speaking. And what about earth? An earthy person is somebody that struggles with like earth, you're just sitting there like a rock, like a lump, whatever. That's someone who's struggling with uh, Laziness or, or you know, non-clinical depression, something, someone who's just kind of like not moving very much. And so these four elements represent the four elements, if you will, spiritual elements that a person needs to refine within themselves. This similar concept is found in Buddhism. Actually, interesting, Hinduism has a fifth element as well. Hinduism, there's a fifth element called ether. So air, fire, wind, and water, and ether. That's the fifth one that the Hindus add that it sort of links them all. They're all in the ether. It's interesting, though, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov in Lukute Maharan also adds that there is a fifth element called ego, right, which sort of uh, is, incorporates them all. Self-importance, that, that's the root of all of the other struggles of the earth, air, fire, and water. The, the ego is, is the, that fifth element. So we, again, we have similarities in sort of like the mystical uh, worldview in, in some things. Also the concept of compassion. Compassion, Buddhism, is uh, compassion is a result of perceiving the interconnectedness of all of creation, of all of reality. Uh, Judaism sees even though Judaism sees human beings as the central figure in creation, we were like sort of the top of the spiritual food chain, um, it, it, it also asserts, though, a kinship with all of creation as well. Jewish mysticism in particular is, is sensitive towards all life, right? towards animals, towards plants. There's laws promoting compassion to animals and all of God's creations. Um, there's a story told uh, of the Rebbe Rayatz, the, the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, he was walking with his father one day when he was a young child. He writes about this in his memoirs. And he, when he was walking with his father, what do children do when they're walking along the way? Sometimes adults do this as well. You know, you're walking by a bush or by a flower, you pick the flower, you pick the leaves off, and you just start ripping it and just, just because you're fidgety. And so the, the, the previous Rebbe wrote that he was walking with his father when he was a child, and he just sort of pulled a, uh, a leaf off of a tree or off of a bush, and his father corrected that behavior, told him that that wasn't appropriate behavior because everything has a, a force of life in it that given by Hashem, that given by God, and that you shouldn't just treat it like it's, like it's nothing. So again, we, we, the idea of, of having compassion even to plants is something promoted in our tradition as well. Um, the idea of the impermanence of the world. Buddhism teaches that the transience of the world, about the transience of the world, that there's not, nothing, it's not lasting, it's not a lasting place. Well, a century before, a century or two before Buddha, Solomon spoke of the earthly desires, earthly pleasures as hevel havalim, as, as, as vanity of vanities, as nothingness, as, 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 tan, as, a, as a transient. In Judaism, impermanence, underscores the urgency for divine service. Rather than pursuing vain materialistic pursuits, this idea that the world is sort of like transient, so, okay, now I have to think, what's the bigger picture? What does is, what is my soul need? What is something that's of permanence that I can seek after? 
uh, reincarnation as well. The East certainly has that. Judaism has uh, this, this belief as well. As we discussed earlier, some of the beliefs in reincarnation were actually started in Judaism. The concept of enlightenment. Enlightenment in Judaism is connected with the mystery of prophecy, the mystery of divine intuition, but also includes varying levels of intuition that are even accessible today, some of which. Uh, also, the concept of the end of days. In Buddhism, there's a gradual global degeneration followed by a being that's going to renew, leading to a path, of nir- a path leading to nirvana, right? a state of, of sort of uh, spiritual transcendence. Uh, presently, that being is residing in the heavens. Again, this is, this is Buddhism talking. So Judaism uh, uh, believes a uh, obviously similar thing. We believe that the soul of Mashiach is, is somewhat similar, reserved in the heavens for when the time is right, and will bring all the Jewish people back to Israel and unite the world under the, under the auspices of God and the knowledge of God. Both faiths also believe in an afterlife and that the, that the deeds of this world matter. So those are some of the similarities. Now let's go to some of the differences. And when we understand the similarities and differences, then we'll understand karma. So far, so good? All right. So, in, Judea, in, in, in Buddhism, there are the four noble truths which comprise the foundation of Buddhism. And the four noble truths are that the world is suffering, that the cause of suffering is desire, that the stopping of suffering comes about from the stopping of desire, and that the stopping of desire is achieved through practicing the noble eightfold path, which includes correct speech, correct action, a right livelihood, and so forth. In other words, if you want to sidestep existential suffering, it comes through dismantling the illusion of sense of self. You have to sort of lose yourself, leave the world. The goal of Buddhism is to escape what's called the wheel of birth and death. And since suicide in Buddhism would only lead to further reincarnation, you're not, you're not escaping the suffering of the world, the only way to escape it is to achieve a state of nirvana, transcend the world, leave the world, spiritually ascend out of the world, and then you escape the wheel of reincarnation. In Judaism, we believe very much the opposite. The goal is not to transcend the world. The goal is not to leave the world. The goal is very much in the world. Judaism is part of a total engagement in this world, in fact. So the 613 commandments of the Torah are the prescriptions that we have from God. It's our spiritual prescription. How to engage in consecrated actions. What am I supposed to do physically in this world to make this world a godly place? Not to leave the world, not to run from the world, not to ascend from the world, but to be in the world, but live in a consecrated way. Do things that are godly. Take objects and make them godly through the actions, through the prescription that God prescribed to us. The Talmud delves into every single detail, including unimaginable situations within its scope. Because, so when it discusses, for example, what vegetables are kosher to be used for the bitter herbs on Passover, right, and the the Talmud will go through a variety of vegetables, like, why, just tell us what to eat. Just tell us, it's either parsley or celery or what, just tell us something, you know, just tell us. Why the arguments and the this and the that and the, can, can it be this, can it be that? Can you use a mushroom, can you use a watermelon, can you, whatever, what, what can you use? It goes through all these different things. Why is it doing that? The reason that this is such a spiritual reason behind it, it's holding each and every object up to the light of the Torah as the litmus test to either be used or dismissed in holy action. In other words, it is the litmus test. It is the Torah is the night vision goggles that we look at this thing and say, ah, that can be used for the bitter herbs. This and not that. And that's why it goes through all these arguments and opinions. and 
because it's holding it up, the, it's holding every object and situation up to the light of Torah and telling us what can be used in consecrated actions. Because the goal of Judaism is to affect this world, not to leave this world, but to affect, to consecrate this world. In, in Kabbalistic thought, teaches that every object contains sparks of holiness. And by using the object in the way that it was ordained to be used by the Torah, that the sparks of holiness that are trapped inside are uplifted and are elevated. The bibli in, in biblical Hebrew, it's interesting. Does anyone know the biblical Hebrew word for religion? Trick question. It's, right, there's no biblical Hebrew word for religion. Why? Because Judaism is life. Judaism is not some spiritual practice that we do on Saturdays. Judaism is not some place that we attend in our synagogue a few times a week or whatever it is, or a few times a year. It is a way of life. It is how we eat, how we sleep, how we work, everything, because everything is spiritual. Every, the whole idea is making the world a spiritual place, not having my world and my spiritual. Everything is spiritual. Everything is meant to be consecrated. The purpose in other religions is to transcend the world. Judaism uses foods and our assets and our everything for a holy purpose. It's a big difference. Other faiths will promote things like fasting and pr like regularly, not just like a few times a year, but like, like that's seen as like a goal, fast for weeks at a time. Fasting and poverty, they see that as holiness, leaving the world, holiness. That's, Judaism says, use the food, use the assets for a divine purpose. This dichotomy is very much pronounced in, in human relations, right, in, 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 rela in human relationships. What are other faiths? What's, what's considered like holy lifestyle? Celibacy. What does Judaism teach? Judaism teaches, in contrast to that worldview, that with proper discipline and regulation, the act of human relationships can be the most sanctified of all actions that a human being can do. So, Let's, let's, let's get into karma. Now that we have an understanding, we have understand some of the basic differences of the Eastern faiths and Judaism and Jewish mysticism, let's jump into some karma. So karma is, is, a, is a Sanskrit word that means action, effect, or fate. Right? So do Jews believe, so we can, if it's with the, que the question that we're asking here, do Jews believe in karma? The same thing could be said, do Jews believe in fate? Do Jews believe in actions having, ha having a meaning in the world and, and uh, having a, so karma is an idea also that permeates not only the Eastern religions, but also in Egypt and in, in Greece and even in modern quantum physics, right? Finish the sentence, what goes around comes around, right? Isn't that karma, essentially? That what you put out there comes back to you. Right? It's even the whole thing of like the law of attraction and that it's talked about in, that they, that they talk about in, in, in quantum physics and all, that, that you put it, whatever energy you put out there comes back to you. It's all part of the system, right? It's like, it's like those little, uh, in my mother-in-law's house, we were just there, they had one of those like, you know, little thing with the, with the, with the metal balls and you you know, you, you, you swing it and it goes boom, boom, you know, it, and it, my kids were like fascinated by it. That's karma, right? Every action has a reaction. So do Jews believe in karma? Right? Is, there, is, is it part of the system? What I put out there is going to come back to me? Sort of. Where's the difference? Where's the difference? So in karma, in the, in the, in, when we talk about karma, what we, t what we discuss is that basically... Everything is within the system. Whatever you put out into the universe, the universe is going to bring back to you. Right? Is that, is that, would you say that's like a pretty clear understanding of karma? So 
it's, it's the idea of, of cosmic justice that it's relative to your merits and your faults. Whatever I put out, whatever I do, if I do good stuff, good stuff's going to come back. If I do bad stuff, bad stuff's going to come back. So Judaism teaches, right, that we're beyond the system. In other words, karma is all about being part of the system, measure for measure. What I put out there, if I put the good vibes out there, the good actions out there, I do the good stuff, I'm going to get good stuff back. It's part of the system. It's the, right, the tit for tat. But Judaism says, that's true. There is a system. God created a universe, and there is a system. You could put the good stuff in, good stuff's going to come back to you. That's, right, we do believe in reward and punishment and measure for measure. That is, that is part of the equation. However, we are not confined to the system. There's a system, there's a universe, there's rules that God made and how the system works, and good, good, right? Good brings good and bad brings bad. But we are not limited to the system. And this is a very important concept to remember. The whole concept of the idea of tshuva, of repentance, of returning to God, essentially is a way of changing your fate. Right? There's the initial fate, the initial timeline that, that comes out from it. But tshuva, repenting, changes the results. Think about tshuva as like a spiritual time travel, if you will. Right? Anyone ever see Back to the Future Part 2? Right? I can't see you, so I'm assuming that everyone's saying yes. Right? What, the, the whole idea is that you go back in time, you change that an event that no longer happened, it creates this new timeline that wasn't there until now, and that fate that had come from this action no longer exists. Let's say a person does something that they weren't supposed to do. It happens from time to time. And you do tshuva for it, really sincere tshuva. You, 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 you pray to God, you resolve, you're not going to do it again. You've, you've been forgiven. So now all of the ripple effects that come about from that action that you did back in the day are canceled out. All the negative ripple effects that that created never existed because you've been forgiven for it. God has wiped you clean. It didn't happen. And so all the ripple effects that came from it, the negative spiritual ripple effects that came upon your life from that action are no longer there. Because why? Because we're not connected. We're not confined to the system. The system would tell you, well, you did the wrong thing. Sorry, Charlie. No way to escape that. Part of the computer program, part of the system. We have a connection with the computer programmer. We're not limited to the system. I gotta ask you a question. Anybody fly here? Anybody, 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 did anybody have to fly here to get to this retreat? Okay, many of you. Did you ever in your life have an issue with your ticket? with your flight, meaning that they, you feel they overcharge you, you needed to change your ticket. Let's say you're getting to change your ticket. Happens a lot. And then, you, so you call them up or you go online, whatever it is, and then there's a change fee and you have to pay the difference and there's all sorts of fees attached. And, and you're talking to the person on the phone and they tell you, I'm sorry, sir, I'm sorry, ma'am. Right, you know, this is our policy. This is the system. I'm sorry. What does every good Jewish person do when they say, I'm sorry, sir or ma'am? That's the rules. That's the system. What does every good Jew say? Let me speak to your supervisor. And if the supervisor can't help, what do you do? You talk to their supervisor, and a good Jew will get the CEO of JetBlue on the phone to make the change before accepting any of the hidden fees. And it happens a lot of times with cell phone companies. All, all the time you call customer service, they say, and they're correct. What they say is correct. They say, I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry, ma'am. These are the rules. This is the system. This is what we do. But if there is a program, if there is a system, there's also a computer programmer. I'm sorry, sorry, I don't think I... Let me talk to the pro computer programmer. The computer, the program says it can only do this and that. What does the computer... Pro oh, the programmer just says, oh, wait, I'll just delete that. We don't have to, we don't have to, we don't have to do that, right? 
So karma says you're confined to the system, measure for measure. You put out the good, the good comes back. You put out the bad, the bad comes back, which is true. But you are not confined to the system. You have the program manager. You have the program, the system manager. You have the supervisor of all supervisors at your disposal. So do Jews believe in karma? Sort of, kind of, maybe. But we are not confined by karma. We have tshuva. We have access to the system manager, the supervisor of all supervisors. It's interesting. The Torah specifies, how many children did we say earlier? How many children did Abraham send to the east? Six children. It's interesting because in Jewish tradition, the number that symbolizes completion is what number? Seven. Right? There's seven days in a week. Seven notes on the music scale, seven continents, right? Seven colors of the rainbow, Roy G. Biv. Sevens everywhere. It symbolizes completeness in creation. So what's six? Just short. Just short. It's almost there. It's close. It's God's, but just not there. It's like having six days of the week and no Shabbos. The whole purpose is the Shabbos, though. Right? You're missing the whole point. You got it six days. You just work, work, work. Without the Shabbos, you got nothing. Right? In fact, in Hebrew, how do we, what, what do we call the week? We say, what, what do we call Sunday? Yom Rishon, L'Shabbos. It's the first day till Shabbos. Second day till Shabbos. Because it's all about Shabbos. You got six. You got no Shabbos. You're missing something. So he sent six children over there. Six children were sent just short of completion. It was interesting. There's a, uh, so, uh, Rabbi uh, Noah Orlowick. He says something very interesting. He says, even the word in Hebrew, how do you say Hindu, Indian, right? In, 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 in Hebrew, Indian, Hodi, Hodi, right? Which is spelled He, Vav, Dalid, Yud, okay? Which is almost the same letters as God's divine name. How do you spell God's divine name? Yud with a He and a Vav and a He. Hodi is a he and a vav. It's the same letter. Almost, almost exactly the same letters. A he and a vav and a dalid and a yud. The only difference in letters is that one has a dalid and one has a he. Right? What's the difference graphically between a dalid and a he? Just a little dot. Just a little yud on the bottom. Right? There's a dalid and then the he, you just add a little dot, a little, a little yud on the bottom. That changes it from a, a dalid to a he. And that's the same thing with the religions of the East. The religions of the East is, it's so close. It's like that, this, so, so there's spirituality, there's wisdom, but it's just missing that Yud, just missing the Yud. The Yud is the only letter in the Hebrew alphabet that is sort of above, it's just kind of floating there, right? All the other letters are, it's, it's floating, it's, it represents divinity. And it's just missing the divinity. It's just missing the God element. It's just, there's, it's, it's close, there's wisdom, there's, but it's, there's something missing. And that something can be found in Judaism. We don't have to run to the religions of the East. We don't have to run to other philosophies. We have mysticism. We have spirituality. We have karma. We have, we have whatever you want. Judaism is the all you can eat buffet. We have it all. I'm going to close with a short story. There's a story told of a man named Isaac who had this recurring dream. He lived in a, in, a, in a poor village, and he heard that in his dream that in Prague, by the king's palace, there was a bridge. And in his dream, there was, there was gold buried right in, under that bridge. And he was so infatuated by this dream, this recurring dream. Now, the journey from where he was to Prague was many miles, many hundreds of miles. But at the same time, like he had this recurring dream, he, he, he had to go, even though, again, back then, his horse and buggy would take him a long time to get there, but he kept dreaming about it, and he just had to do it. All, and so when he gets there, he starts, he starts digging. He's right by the palace, he's under the bridge, but he's right by the palace, and so one of the guards in the palace said, hey, what are you doing over here? You can't just dig, you know, dig. He says, look, I, I, don't, I don't know why, but I had this, I had this great feeling this recurring dream 
that there's buried treasure right here under this bridge. And I promise you, if you let me dig here, I'll give you some of the gold. I'll give you some of the treasures. He's, the guard says, you know, it's so funny because I've been having a recurring dream that there's some guy who's going to come from afar to looking for gold, but meanwhile, there's gold buried under the floorboards of his own house. And so the guy says, Isaac says, oh my gosh. And he returns home and he looks under his oven, right? There was a, some planks that were out of shape. He lifts up the planks and under, under the floorboards of his own house, he sees this buried treasure. This is very much the story of Jews sometimes. A lot of times we think we have to run to, the, to a distant land in order to acquire a spiritual wisdom. And meanwhile, under the floorboards of our own home, in the floorboards of our own heart as well, we have the greatest buried treasure that ever happened to humanity. We've got to look under the floorboards of our own house. We don't have to seek out things from, uh, from other places. It's, there's wisdom there. There's good stuff. But the floorboards of our own house, we can't beat the buried treasure that we have. We have eternal connection with the supervisor of all supervisors. Thank you very much. Click the button below to subscribe to the JLI YouTube channel. It's like a relaxing spa for the soul.